So as already uh, said in his prayer, I absolutely believe it's because of this message that, number one, I'm even alive, but uh, definitely for sure that I'm um, still a Seventh-day Adventist. <clears throat> and having been raised as a Seventh-day Adventist, I basically faded out of um, the church while here attending Andrews University. Uh, with my acceptance to uh, medical school at Loma Linda, I pretty much gotten what I wanted out of it and headed off there to figure out what else was in the world. And I knew, I knew that uh, uh, there was a God, but uh, I had not yet, um, in a very powerfully, what, powerful way, experienced him um, daily in my life. And uh, the religion that I had was very much a uh, fear-motivated, works-based um, religion, and it wasn't until hearing this message that I was, uh, to a degree, set free and uh, empowered in my life and inspired um, to live my life uh, for Him. Before we begin, I'd like to just bow our heads just one more time. And Father in Heaven, for the time that we have this morning, I just pray that you can speak through me. Take these words, and may your spirit use them in each heart here to, to draw them closer to an understanding of what you would have for us as an end time people. May it transform our lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning my goal is to review the two covenants, and to do that fairly quickly. And then, um, let's see, we're starting at 9, 10. I'm going to finish by 10 o'clock. And, um, and then to look at what, have, what might have been with ancient Israel and what might be still with Adventism. And so as we look at the covenants, I'd like you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. And we'll just begin with verse 21, where Paul is talking to the Galatians about covenants. And the Bible rarely refers to the old and new or the two covenants, but it makes the distinction, and here is a clear distinction of the two covenants. And so Paul, writing to the Galatians, says, Tell me, you who desire to be under law, do you not hear the law? Talking about the Torah. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Paul is talking to the Galatians, who have been a group of people that were converted by the gospel. But in addition to the gospel, they felt the need to add to what God had already given them. And they were making that into a means of salvation. And so he is expounding this. So what I want to look at briefly is um, the law that was given in Sinai. And so I want to turn back to Exodus chapter 19. And Paul states here, that this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. What happened at Mount Sinai? That's where God came down to the children of Israel. And God came down to do what? He came down to speak the law. Does that mean that the law is the old covenant? And that's Hagar. And that's the one that's in bondage. And that's what we want to look at. So let's turn back over to Exodus. And we'll start in verse 19. 
chapter 19. And so, chapter 19 starts off uh, in verse 1, stating the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. They had been taken miraculously out of the land of Egypt. They had crossed through the sea, and they were now out in the wilderness. But this had only been for a few months, and on the third month, they're now standing at the base of a mountain. And God comes down. What I want you to see in this preamble is that God did not come down with the intent of giving them an old covenant. And sometimes this is confused by evangelicals and even Seventh-day Adventists that the, well, the law is the old covenant. It's the means of salvation in the Old Testament and now we have Jesus Christ in the new. That's not what happened. Before we look any further, let's digress back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, speaking of Abraham that Paul referenced in Galatians, verse 1, God told Abraham what? Get out of your country, away from your family, away from your father's house to a land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth shall, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God came down to Abraham just as he's come down to the children of Israel. And he gives him this amazing promise. What does he promise him? He promises to bless him and to make him a blessing. When God has a new covenant people, it's not for their own benefit that he gives them the new covenant. It's not for their own benefit that he gives them the gospel, but that they can be a blessing to others. And wrapped up in this promise that God gives to Abraham is the promise that in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed God gave Abraham a picture of the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus was going to come through Abraham's seed and would be the savior of the world. Now, we know in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham is the father of who? The father of the faithful. And one of the things I just love and am amazed by the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 is that despite of all of the ups and downs and ups and downs of God's people, when their history is written, what is recorded? Just the ups, not the downs. When God looks at our ups and down history, what's ultimately recorded in history is that they were a people of faith. And unless we resist that faith and are put blotted out of the Lamb's book of life, all that will be recorded was the righteous acts that God was able to do in his children. But in the Old Testament and throughout the rest of the Bible, the story is put in there so that we can see that these were real human beings just like us with the same frailties who weren't suddenly born as the great man of faith, Abraham. He had to learn faith. And so... We can learn from him as to principles of the Old and the New Covenant. <clears throat> and so, when Abraham heard God's promises, was he appreciative? Scripture says that he believed and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But that's the conclusion. That's the summary. In between, there was some what? Unbelief. And that's what the gospel is all about, is to root out our unbelief so that we can be held up to the world as a witness to God. And so the forefathers of the Israelites, Abraham, this great man of faith, had a faith problem. And so just going to summarize it, you guys know this story very well, but 
Abraham had a hard time believing God's promise because it took a long time. God seems to have a delay in fulfilling his promises. David was anointed to be king of Israel and it took 15 years before he finally became king. He thought his life was going to be blotted out. But yet through that process, David learned many things. He wrote many of the Psalms. He had experiences with God that he needed to be prepared for being king. Moses. Moses spent the first 40 years becoming one of the greatest people in all Egypt. And he learned many things, but he spent the next 40 years wandering in the wilderness, tending sheep. The first 40 years he was becoming somebody, the next 40 years he was becoming nobody. So that God could take a nobody and make them a somebody in leading his people. There are delays, and Abraham was getting old, it was beginning to look like God has promised certain things, but it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen with my wife, Sarah. She's beyond the age of bearing a child. So this is an impossibility, an absolute possibility that in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so what did Abraham do? He turned to the flesh to try to help fulfill the promise that God had made to him. Was that the Old Covenant or the New Covenant? So that's what Paul identified in Galatians as the son of bondage. Ishmael could never be the fulfillment of the promise. Only Isaac was the child of promise. Only Isaac was the one that came because of nothing that Abraham did. And the things that Abraham did were tainted and flawed, and that could not fulfill the promise. And so, E.G. Wagner, when he presented in the Glad Tidings and presented in the 1888 era, made the case that the Old Covenant and the New Covenant has more to do with how we respond to God's promises than about a condition of time or an era. And so, as evangelicals believe that we're under a dispensation of the gospel and before we were under the dispensation of the law, there are no two dispensations. The covenants, although sometimes can talk about a period of time, most helpful for me, most helpful for us is to recognize it's more about how we respond. When we respond by faith, God will produce the promise that he has promised to do. And so, back to Exodus chapter 19. Children of Israel were in the wilderness of Sinai. Verse 2, they departed from there to the desert of Sinai and they camped in the wilderness and they camped before the mountain. And Moses went up to God in the mountain and the Lord called to him from the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. What is God doing here? He's renewing the covenant, the promises that he made to Abraham. Thus you shall say, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. What did the Israelites do to cross the Red Sea? They were helpless. They could not possibly have gotten out of that without divine intervention. So God is just saying, this is what I've done for you. I've given you all this already. You have seen what I did. I bore you on eagles' wings and I brought you to myself. Now therefore, you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant and you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people for all the earth is mine. And you shall be what? 
You shall be a kingdom of priests. Remember that because we're going to come back and look at that. You shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And so Moses called for the elders and the people and he laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said what? All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now, sometimes we think this is the point where the old covenant came in instead of the new. The people, God made promises to them and they made promises to him. Um, the problem wasn't the words of the people. That's not what it is. If they truly had in their hearts a desire to say, yes, Lord, make this so, we want to do that, that could have been a new covenant response. Amen. And the Lord talks about that in Deuteronomy 15. We don't have time to go there. But God knew what was truly in their hearts. And they were not truly converted. And they didn't know their own condition, but they're responding to God. And what is in their hearts is revealed in what happened over the next 40 days. So, before we go to that, though, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the, peop uh, of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon the mount in the sight of how many? All the people. God is coming down to meet with his people. And you shall set bounds around the people, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base, because whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. So for three days, God sets them apart. God says for three days, don't go close to the mountain because I'm coming down. And if God is coming down and they go close to the mountain, but they haven't been sanctified, what would happen? They'd be destroyed by it. And so, they're set apart. They're called to consecrate themselves, to wash themselves, to purify themselves, to enter in to an experience of repentance so that they can be prepared to meet with their God. And so, it continues in the end of verse 13. When the trumpets sound long, they shall, they shall come near the mountain. So for three days, stay away from the mountain. But once you're purified... Once you're sanctified, once you've repented, once you're cleansed from sin, you are called to come to the mountain. And so then it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there was thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud. What does this picture of the thunderings and the lightnings remind you of? We see the same picture in Revelation and also in Ezekiel. God has a movable throne with the four living creatures and there's lightnings flashing back and forth. There's smoke. This is an amazing, incredible, awesome picture of God's throne. The Son of God has come from heaven on his movable throne down to Mount Sinai and he is settling down to meet with his people. And they all were supposed to meet with their God because they were all supposed to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so was God coming down to establish an old covenant? Was God coming down to establish a works-based religion that they could be saved by? No. He was coming down to make them a holy people who followed his promises just as Abraham had. And that has been his, that was his intent. So, the trumpet was very loud and all the people who were in the camp did what? Trembled. Even Moses trembled. This was a holy God. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. 
Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and because it came louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. How many would perish? Not all of them. There were some who had sanctified their hearts and were prepared. But the vast majority of the Israelites didn't know their own hearts. They did not enter into this experience in a solemn way. They did not repent. And they took for granted how holy and sacred God is when he comes in his, in his presence. And they were not prepared. And so, the story goes on in the following chapters that Moses is the one that went before God. Later, when they went up to receive the Ten Commandments, Moses took um, Aaron and her and uh, the high priest and uh, 70 of the elders and they went up into the mountain. The people that were sanctified could go up into the mountain. And God spoke the words in Exodus chapter 20, what we now know as the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are often written as this list of things that we cannot do or as a list of things we have to do. But Wagner pointed out in 1888 that these are just promises. Ten promises that God promises his people that he will fulfill. First four deal with our relationship to him. The last four, our last six, our relationship with each other. God's promises to the human race that I will fulfill these in you and it will bring great worship and it will bring great relationships and it will save you. It'll save you in every nation around you. A lot of suffering if you would just follow these. And so, just want to make it very, very clear that God did not come down to Sinai to establish the Old Covenant. What turned Sinai into the Old Covenant? Why did Paul say that Sinai is Hagar, the Old Covenant? Because in the process, the people were not sanctified. In the words that all the Lord says we will do, they took upon themselves as something they had to do in order to earn God's favor. And the whole rest of the history of the Israelites is a history of up and down and up and down, shortcomings and failings as a people. I actually have notes, but I haven't seen them yet, so I'll see where I am. So, what I'd like to look at and then we'll make the extrapolation to us, is what might have happened if they had become a kingdom of priests in a holy nation. And so before we look at that, what did they get instead? So, first of all, there was a great apostasy right at the base of the mountain. The cloud is still on the mountain. And Moses has gone up into the mountain for 40 days. And the people very quickly forget that they were just set apart, that they were just sanctified. They see that cloud, and from what they can tell, that's just going to stay there. So let's get on with life. In fact, let's not get on with life. we got to get going because we want to get to the promised land because we want the land flowing with milk and honey. They wanted what was in it for them, and they didn't want the process. 
much like we do. And so Moses is up there and he sends Aaron and her down and uh, to lead the people. He sends the 70 elders down. Joshua stays up there with him. And of course, Moses goes in and meets with God and he's given the law. And when he comes back down to the camp, what does he find? He finds pagan worship going on in the camp of God's holy people. And so, the Old Covenant was broken before the New Covenant even started. Were there some that did not participate in the worship of the golden calf? Yeah, we're told all of the Levites kept themselves apart. There were some that stood against it and were put to death because they opposed the golden calf. This was a very serious apostasy. And so what did the Israelites get? Instead of being a kingdom of priests, they got one tribe that became the priests. Instead of being a holy nation, they have a history that ultimately ended with the crucifixion of Christ. And the whole history of the Israelite nation as God could have used it is mostly a miserable failure. And so what I'd like to do is read an excerpt from E.J. Wagner from the book The Everlasting Covenant. And if you uh, would like to find a really good book on the covenants, I'd recommend the uh, Glad Tidings, but especially The Everlasting Covenant. So two books that have really blessed me from the 1888 era on the covenants is Ellet J. Wagner's book, The Everlasting Covenant. And recently, Dr. Skip McCarty, who was a pastor here, now retired, wrote a book called In Granite and Ingrained. And as a member of the Gospel Study Group, we had the opportunity to serve as the editorial committee of that book. And I would also state that that book, is of all the books written in recent Times is, is the most gospel-centered encapsulating the covenant um, idea of any book that I've read. And so I'd encourage you to read both of these books. So there's a chapter in this book on page 269 where Dr. Wagner um, entitled it, Israel, a Missionary People. When God sent Moses to lead Israel from Egypt, his message to Pharaoh was, Israel is my son even my firstborn, and I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And he brought them forth, and he gave them the land of the heathen, that they might observe his statues and keep his laws. They were not able to worship God in Egypt. They were not able to keep his laws in Egypt because they were slaves. And so Wagner says, the great advantage of the Jews over other people was that unto them were committed the oracles of God, quoting Romans 3. <clears throat> to be sure, they did not receive those lively oracles in all their living power and thus make their advantage infinitely greater, but that was not the fault of God. And we are not now considering what Israel actually had and what Israel actually was, but what they might have possessed and what they ought to have been. So, he says, two things have always been true, namely that no man liveth unto himself, and that God is no respecter of persons. And these two truths combine from a third, which is that whenever God bestows any gift or advantage upon any person, it is in order that he might use that gift as a benefit to others. God does not bestow blessings upon one person or people that he does not wish all to have. He wasn't separating out Israel so that he could give them his law so that they could be special people over here and then neglect the whole rest of the world. They were to be a missionary people. When he promised blessing to Abraham, it was in order that he might bless, be a blessing to others and that the whole world might be blessed. It was in the line of the promise to Abraham that God delivered Israel. 
Therefore, in giving them the advantage of possessing his law, it was that they might make known to other people that inestimable advantage, so that the other people might also share it. God's purpose was that his name should be made known in all the earth. His desire that all people should know him was as great as that the children of Israel should know him themselves. To know the only true God is life eternal. You get that point? God had just as much interest that all the world would know him as he had an interest that his people would know them. We can extrapolate that to Seventh-day Adventists because sometimes we think we're God's special people, right? We're God's remnant people. We think that gives us special advantages. The only thing it should give us is special responsibilities. Because God loves everyone out there just as much as he loves us. And he wants us to be the tool to reach them. And that's why we've been given a special message. So, therefore, in revealing himself to Israel, God was showing them the way of eternal life. Or the gospel in order that they might proclaim the same gospel to others. God chose them not because he loved them more than he did the others, but because he loved all men and would make himself known to them by the means of the agents that were nearest at hand. The Israelites had the privilege of being Abraham's seed. They'd had this privilege of having the father of faith. And God was just going to use them and build on what they already had to reach the whole world. And there's many examples. Rahab, um, Ruth, the Moabitess. God was constantly reaching out to other places. Gave visions to Nebuchadnezzar. So over on page 272, it's kind of interesting. God's design for Israel was that they should proclaim the gospel to the world is seen in the fact that if they abode in his covenant, they were to be a kingdom of priests. All were to be priests of God. Now the work of a priest is set forth in Malachi. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, speaking of the priest. And iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did not turn many from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law as his mouth and he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. So a priest is to be set apart. A priest is to be sanctified. A priest is to expound the law. And a priest is to be a messenger of the Lord. Each person in Israel was to be a priest. So if all the Israelites were priests, would they need a priesthood for themselves? No, they'd all have a spiritual connection with God. God would come down and dwell with them, the whole nation. Continuing on page 272, to turn men away from iniquity is the work of Christ through his resurrection. Therefore, the work of the true priest is simply to preach the gospel. To proclaim the living law and the living Savior, this is perfect, converting the soul. But since all the children of Israel were to be priests, and therefore all familiar with the law, it is evident that they were to be the priests on behalf of others. If they had accepted God's proposition and been content to abide in his covenant instead of insisting on their own, there would have been no need of any priesthood to make the law of truth in peace known to them. They would have all known the truth and consequently all have been free. But the office of a priest is to teach the law and therefore it is positive that God's purpose in bringing Israel out of Egypt was to send them to all over the world preaching the gospel. Israel, a missionary people. What an easy and speedy task this would have been for them backed by the power of God. You get that? How many years has it taken us so far to preach the gospel around the world? Wagner says this is an easy and speedy task, backed by the power of God. Here's why. The fame of what God had done in Egypt had, been, had already preceded them. And as they went forth with the same power, they could preach the gospel in its fullness to people already prepared to accept or reject it. Our goal is not to go out there and find people that are rejecting the gospel and try to convince them that they shouldn't do it. Their minds are made up. But there's many out there that haven't heard the gospel but have hearts 
that are open to truth. Those are the ones that we're looking for. So leaving their wives and little ones safe in the land of Canaan and going out two by two as Jesus afterwards sent out his disciples, it would have taken them but a short time to carry the gospel to the remotest parts of the earth. Suppose enemies attempted to oppose their progress. Well, the Bible says that one could chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight. Under his spirit, two people. We saw that with Jonathan and David. Two people could put 10,000 to flight. That is, the power of the presence of God with any two of them would render them in the eyes of their enemies as equal to 10,000 men. And none would dare attack them, so they could go about their appointed work of preaching the gospel without fear of molestation. There are places in our world that are dangerous for Americans to go to. Dangerous for outsiders to go to. But with the special protection of the Holy Spirit and God's outpouring spirit, should we have to fear? The terror which their presence would inspire in opposers shows the power which the message they proclaimed would have on hearts to open and receive truth. As they should go forth thus clothed with the full power of God, the ground would not need to be gone over the second time. All who heard would at once take their position either for or against the truth. He's painting a picture here where the issues are so crystal clear and sharp that as soon as people come in contact with these messengers and they hear the truth, they are convicted to the core. And they either harden their hearts against it completely or they respond and their hearts are melted and they respond completely. This isn't a long, drawn-out process. All who heard would once take their position either for or against the truth. This decision would be final since when one rejects the gospel when proclaimed in its fullness, that is, with the mighty power of God, there is nothing more that can be done with him. For there is no greater power than that of God. So a very few years and even possibly a few months after crossing into the Jordan, what have sufficed for the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom in all the world as a witness to the nations. But Israel did not fulfill its high calling. Unbelief and self-trust deprived them of the prestige which, with which they entered the promised land. They did not let their light shine, and so in time they themselves lost it. They were content instead to colonize Israel Instead of possessing the whole earth, they assumed that the light which God had given them was due to the fact that he loved them better than the others. And so they became haughty and wound up becoming despised by the others. Nevertheless, God ceased not to indicate to them that they were to be the light of the world. The history of the Jews, instead of showing that God was shut up to them, shows that he was continually trying to use them. They were to be a separate people, separate solely because of the sanctifying presence of God. And in being a separate people, he tells how they were to draw others in to join them, but they weren't to join others. They were a separate, sanctified, set-apart, holy people. We have just a few minutes remaining. Let me read from uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 314. Ellen White states that from a race of slaves, the Israelites had been exalted above all peoples to be the peculiar treasure of the King of Kings. God had separated them from the world that he might commit to them a sacred trust. He had made them the depositaries of his law. And he purposed through them to, pressure, to preserve among men the knowledge of himself. To preserve among men, the rest of the world, a knowledge of himself. Thus the light of heaven was to shine out to a world enshrouded in darkness. And a voice was to be heard appealing to all peoples to turn from their idolatry, to serve the living God. If the Israelites would be true to their trust, they would become a power in the world. God would be their defense 
and he would exalt them above all other nations. His light and truth would be revealed through them, and they would stand forth under his wise and holy rule as an example of the superiority of his worship over every other form of idolatry. We live in a world today, it's essentially a world of idolatry. Now I'm happy, thrilled that I grew up in America. Not everyone here is an American, but most of you are. There's one Australian I know, and several others. But growing up in America gave us a heritage that lets America stand as a light to the rest of the world. America, more than any other country, took the principles of the Protestant Reformation and put those to work. And Jerry mentioned that last night. And it has been a huge blessing by having these principles, most of them derived from biblical principles, it gave America immense standing in the world. Great blessings. Ellen White states that as time goes on, we will repudiate every principle of our Constitution. And this great nation that started off like the lamb looking like Christ is going to turn into the dragon looking like Satan. In this past year, I've been thinking about the fact that, you know what? We still think it's a pretty good country, and it's still an amazing country. But when you look around us, we are being bombarded by messages that are completely contrary to the gospel everywhere we turn, like never before. And it's becoming the majority. Um, it, not too many places we need to look. One of Satan's greatest tactics is to bring in um, Darwin's theory of evolution in 1859 when he wrote the book The Descent of Man. That was to counteract Romans 120, which states that God's invisible attributes are clearly seen in his creation. If God's invisible attributes are clearly seen so that every single person with, without excuse, Satan wants to do something great to counteract that. And he's done that by taking the focus away from the Creator with this crazy theory of evolution. And uh, Bob has encouraged me these last couple of years to realize how evolutionary thought slips in even subtly into our thinking. And so it's just very simple to say, well, um, I worked on this model this year, but this one's better this next year, and so it's evolving. Lindy might ask me, how's my talk going? I said, well, I could say, it's evolving. Our whole culture knows what that means, right? Except it doesn't mean what we think it means. It's absurd. We're using it in a completely wrong way. Because we're using it in a way that assumes that because we say it's evolving, it's getting better and better and better. But if we're truly evolutionists, it would have to get better and better and better on its own over many periods of time. And so I put in heart stents. We have a heart valve. It's called the Evolute. It's the third generation. So we have the Evolute R, and now we have the Evolute Pro. And I was meeting with the vice president of the company and the vice president for research, and they said, what do you think of our stent? I said, well, I like your stamp very much, except for the name. And they said, what do you mean? <laughs> Bob has challenged me, and I'm trying to take this all out. I'm trying to take these little words out of my vocabulary. I'm trying no longer to say, I bet you that you'll do this tomorrow, because I don't want gambling language. I'm trying to get evolution out of my vocabulary. It's just so ingrained in every single thing we do. I told them, I don't like your stamp, or the name of your stamp. And they said, well, why? And I said, well, let me ask you about it. What does evolute mean? It means it's evolving. It, the evolutionary idea of evolving is that you guys put it in a box and you just shook it for a long time and it came out 
a little bit different, but why don't you ask your scientists, how many hours did they put into this? How much research dollars did you spend? How many research trials did you do testing it on people? This took a lot of creative talent and a lot of creative work. You should call it CREATE. <laughs> the vice president looked at me and said, yeah, you've got a point. But the point is, these things creep in everywhere. Our music, our media, Kids in school are taught that if you want to find out what sex you are, you should trust your feelings over science. Everything is up in flux. Even in theology. Even the theology of evangelicals, but what's even creeping into Adventism? Counters. God's promises of the everlasting covenant. Uh-oh, Andy says I'm done. Just a few examples, real quick. So, when you die, you go to heaven, right? Sinners go to hell. But Isaiah 33 says it's actually the righteous that dwell in the everlasting fire. Satan has taken every single thing in our culture and turned it completely upside down so it points away from God in the whole wrong picture theologically. I have a whole list here. I don't have time to go into it. So let's flip over to chapter you guys all know, Revelation chapter 14. Is God still going to have a kingdom of priests? Is he still going to have a people who he can write his law on their hearts so that it becomes natural to do his laws? Is this something we're going to do by conjuring up enough willpower so that we can look good? I'm tired of that. I was raised on that kind of Adventism. It's powerless, and it leaves you feeling empty and discouraged. There has to be a countercultural demonstration to the world that's no longer rhetorical but is demonstrated because our postmodern culture won't accept it that it comes out of the Bible. They want to see it demonstrated. But they're open to a demonstration. And God promises in Revelation 14. He looked, and behold, a lamb standing on the Mount of Zion, and with him were 144,000, having their father's names written on their foreheads. Let me close with just a story. So, as a result of being a part of the Adventist Medical Evangelism Network, I've been encouraged over the last 14 years to find a way to engage my patients in a spiritual conversation. And like what Patty shared this morning, I do not believe that there's any power to overcome smoking unless I give them the power of Jesus in their lives. And so I want to point every one of my patients to the only power to make real change. And I believe that if they respond to that power, whether it be to change their diet, to stop smoking, it's still the same gospel message that they're responding to. And that same principle carried further and further and further is the gospel, the power to make changes in people's lives. And so I always offer, when I see my patients at the end, I always conclude by saying, by the way, one of the things I offer to do is have a prayer. Is that something that you'd appreciate? And a patient of mine, I'll call him Ron, he's actually an ex very accomplished, well-known, influential and prosperous home builder in our area. The biggest homes in our home, in our region, everybody would know they're built by this guy. He's 84, 80, 83 or 84 years old. And I said, oh, by the way, Ron, one of the things I offer to do is have a prayer. And he turned at me and he smiles. The Dr. Schwartz, we've gone over this before. Remember, I'm an atheist. And I try not to keep praying with the atheists because I don't want to alienate them. But somehow I just forgot. I didn't know I didn't note the NP in my chart, and I just made my usual offer. He said, Dr. Schwartz, I'm an atheist. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, Ron, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't mean to impose anything on you. And I said, all right, well, we'll see you back. He says, well, I'll tell you what. You're going to pray for a minute or two. Can I ask you a question? And I said, well, sure. And he says, well, can you answer to me, why are the evangelicals so behind Donald Trump? 
He says, if he hasn't broken six, if he hasn't broken all ten commandments, he's broken at least six. And I don't get why they line up with somebody like him. Now, I don't care to debate Donald Trump and all of his policies and that. But I said, Ron, this is more than a two-minute question. He goes, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I said, no, I'll answer it. So I, had, I said, but I'm going to sit back down and we're going to talk about this. And so this is an atheist. And I said, Ron, the reason is, is because most Christians have become just like the Jews in Christ's day. They're not looking for a heavenly kingdom. They're looking for power here on this earth, and they want it now. And they are willing to sacrifice all of their values about character and adultery and gambling and all these things that we can list as long as they get power. And the power they want, they want the Supreme Court, and they're getting that. And when I met with this patient just three days earlier, the embassy in Israel had just been moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And I said, the other thing that they see is that they see that God is coming back to establish an earthly kingdom with earthly power, and it has to be in Jerusalem. And so they see Donald Trump as fulfilling these two things. He's moving the embassy to Jerusalem. He's giving them to the Supreme Court, and they're willing to line up behind him. And I said, so, I said, but I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And he said, well, what does that mean? And I said, we don't believe that this is a literal fulfillment to Israel. This is going to be fulfilled in spiritual Israel. And unfortunately, the evangelicals are following the wrong way. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we want to believe everything in the Bible. And we believe it's going to be fulfilled and that it has a spiritual implication. And he says, oh yeah, the Bible, I've read that two or three times. There's some inconsistencies in there. I don't get how, if God is loving, that there could be all the terrible things that go on in the world, like the Holocaust. And he rattled off a couple of things that were really bad. This is a spiritual conversation with an atheist. And I said, well, Ron, that's a really, really good question. I said, you see that God gets blamed for everything in this world, and it's true. Every day goes by that we don't blame God on bad things that happen in the weather, bad things that happen with heart disease. Every day somebody says, why is God doing this to me? And I've been tempted to think the same thing. God gets blamed for everything. I said, but Ron, what the Bible teaches is that there is a war going on. We call it the great controversy. And let's just imagine that there are onlooking universe of other worlds out there wondering what happens when you don't follow God's law. Every time God intervenes, he gets blamed for interference. And he has to let this play out so that it can be demonstrated once and for all before the whole universe. Whether his law is right or whether just doing our own thing, following our own thing, and following the devil is right. And I said, so, if you could picture this as the one spot in the universe where this is a test case to let this play out, to demonstrate what Satan's principles lead to versus what God's principles lead to, would that give you a different picture? And he says, yeah, I've never heard that before. So that's really very interesting. And so I recommended a book by an evangelical author called God at War. He actually references Ellen White. And he talks about this paradigm. I also got this from Bob. So I get a lot of good stuff from Bob. <clears throat> but um, I said, Ron, I just challenged you to get the book. And you can order it on Amazon. He actually ordered it right there in the seat. He says, I'll read it. I believe that when uh, little by little, little, I get little glimpses of what God wants to do if we will just live our Christianity out in our lives in our everyday occurrences, at work as a doctor, at work at whatever you do, if we will just reach out to people with why we believe what we believe, they will notice the difference. There's many ways I can tell that. But ultimately, God is going to have a people who follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth, and he says in verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The new covenant will be a covenant-keeping people that can portray to the world what God's commandment-keeping people can do. And it will draw all the faithful, downtrodden hearts that will respond to God 
very, very quickly. It doesn't need to take 200 years. It doesn't need to take a decade. It can be completed in a very short time. And God is going to hold that group of people up before the world, but even the onlooking universe as a spectacle. Yeah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we reflect on the failures of Israel, I'm reminded that we, as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, have our own failures. We have been here for five generations wandering in the wilderness, while you continue to call us, to woo us, not because we are better than anyone else in this world, not because you love us more, but because we have been entrusted with a very special message that gives us a jump start on giving it to the whole world. And so Lord, I just pray that we will stop following our own heart's inclinations and allow you to do the work in us to cleanse us, to prepare us, to be ready to stand as that final demonstration before the honlucking universe into our world. May it begin with us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.